Today we continue a sermon series entitled When It Matters Most. We're looking at those pivotal experiences of faith and those defining moments in our lives and in the life of our world where we have to decide what it means to live um, faithfully. We're going to do so today by reading from another time in history where people were deciding what it meant uh, to live as faithful Christians in a world that was not particularly friendly to them, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And as we prepare to do so, let me welcome those who are worshiping with us in the Fellowship Hall. We're so glad to have an expansive worship life, also a growing um, presence on the web. We welcome those who are worshiping online, and we're so pleased to have you as well. So hear now the word of God. You then, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ, and what you have heard from me throughout many witnesses, and trust to faithful people who will be able to teach others as well. Share in suffering like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one serving in the army gets entangled in everyday affairs. The soldier's aim is to please the enlisting officer. And in the case of an athlete, no one is crowned without competing according to the rules. It's the farmer who does the work who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in all things. May the Lord add understanding and insight to this word. In 2015, ta Coates wrote a compelling work entitled Between the World and Me. And the book is framed as a letter to his young son. And in that letter, Coates describes powerful realities of racism in our world and how those forces of racism erode the communal fabric of this country. And, and these pages are filled with beautiful expressions of a father's love for his son, the pages are also filled with reminders of how even such deep love is powerless to protect his boy from what awaits him as he grows up. It, it's a haunting read, and it's an important read. Our scripture passage today is also a letter to a young son who is growing up in a world that is slanted against him, a world that will make him hard to live into the fullness of who God has created him to be. Only this time, it's not due to race, but to creed. Most scholars don't think that the Apostle Paul actually wrote this letter in the form that we have it now. Instead, 2 Timothy is kind of a compilation of letter fragments and other wisdom sayings that were handed down through the church as words of Paul to Timothy, who was a generation younger and whom Paul loved as a son. But the issue at hand for Paul to Timothy is the transmittal of faith, how each generation can overcome the particular challenges of their context, whether it be racism or materialism or secularism, whatever ism you want to choose, how each generation can face those while holding on to core convictions of Christian faith. And as Paul searches for those invisible tendons that tie one generation of another together in faith, he tells Timothy, no one serving in an army gets entangled in everyday affairs. The soldier's aim is to please the enlisting officer. In other words, Paul is saying to Timothy, don't get caught up in the latest ideology, the wind and whim of culture. Remember who you are, stick to your core principles, and be sure to keep them in mind the one who enlisted you in the first place. It sounds like the advice that every parent offers to a child when they're dropped off to college. And it's good advice, really, but it's entirely dependent on knowing the heart and the mind of the enlisting officer the teachings, the values, the priorities of the enlisting officer. And that can be terribly challenging for us. We struggle it with, to, with it today. What teachings of Jesus are timeless truths? What teachings are essential to Christian faith? And which teachings are situation-specific? Which teachings are bound by time and circumstance? And historians who study these things, these things that are essential to Christian faith, suggest two core ideas, just two defining principles that distinguish Jesus from all the other teachers of his day and reveal to us the mind of our enlisting officer. And the first and most radical is that all people, every single person in the world, bears the image of God. Now, you might think that everybody already knows that, but one of the lingering tragedies of human history is that people 
do not actually believe that or don't want to believe it, don't act like they believe it. Yet at the heart of Jewish religion and this new Jesus religion, at the very bedrock, is this radical idea of human equality. It may look in this world like God has favorites, that some people are better than others, rich people, tall people, white people, black people, short people, but it's it's not true. There are not any special privileges or prerogatives in God's eyes when it comes to people. The second perspective unique to our enlisting officer as Christians goes a little deeper, and it's this, that religion, true religion, has more to do with how we live than what we say we believe, or even the religious rituals that we perform. This is an old idea that goes way back to the prophets of Israel who kept insisting that what God really wants is not a lot of bloody, smoking animal carcasses up on an altar. What God really wants is justice in the marketplace and kindness in society and mercy and compassion between neighbors and in families. God wants people to act out the implications of their beliefs. We might call it behavioral religion. Now, traditionally, we have two problems with Jesus' idea of true religion, behavioral religion. And the first is that we keep thinking that religion is the ritual, it's the sacrifice, it's the mayor, it's the mass, the prayers, the hymns. In Jesus' day, there were more than 600 different religious rules that observant Jews were required to keep. And it kept them so busy, they didn't have any time or energy left over for loving their neighbor. It could be full-time work just to do a religious observances. And the other problem is that we Protestant Christians, especially we Presbyterian Reformed Christians, can be convinced that true religion is getting it right intellectually, understanding what we believe. This is actually our specialty. It's our gift to the world, faith-seeking understanding, we sometimes call it. And people on the outside who are looking in on Presbyterian church can think that being a Presbyterian is a little like Well, it's like going to school. And schools, by the way, for obvious reasons, are our specialty. We started more of them than anyone else in this country. And the whole notion, did you know that the whole notion of public education, of the community at large, bearing responsibility for the literacy and the education of all children, not just those whose parents could hire a tutor or pay for tuition, but all children and the community being responsible for it, is a Presbyterian idea. That's one which we unabashedly affirm today. But in the meantime, it's been easy for us to become comfortable with religion as a matter of our intellect. We want to know it. We certainly don't want anyone telling us that we have to feel our religion, that we ought to be emotional about it, and we don't want anybody telling us what to do or how to practice our religion. In fact, when the Anglicans told you the Scotch Presbyterians that we had to use their prayer book in Scotland, well, good old Presbyterians just went to war over it. And what sometimes gets lost is the simple reminder that you really don't believe something. We really don't believe something until it shapes and forms what we do and how we live. And so may I be so bold today to suggest that some activists in Chapel Hill this week called this question on a lot of proper thinking and careful acting Christians. If you've been living under a rock and missed it this week, Silent Sam, a statue that was erected in honor of Confederate soldiers, has stood at the crosswalks of our state's flagship university for more than 100 years And this week, Silent Sam, like so many monuments before him, finally met his fate. And much has already been written about it, much more undoubtedly will. And and I'll leave most of that for the more politically minded. But I dare mention it today because many of us, myself included, struggle to understand the role of Christian faith in these kind of matters if we don't say anything about things like Silent Sam. Are we complicit? If we join the protesters in the tearing down of things like Silent Sam, are we criminal? What's the expectation of behavioral religion? And does the Bible even mention ever 
how God's people have dealt with public monuments erected to honor unjust chapters in history? That's a very legitimate question. And the witness of Scripture is surprisingly clear in these matters. Yes, there is a record in Scripture about how God's people deal with this, and it's surprisingly troubling. In the 32nd chapter of Exodus, we read that Moses was directed by God to destroy the statue of a golden calf, a monument to a false god whose worship included the degradation of women. Had the Chapel Hill folks known their Bible, they would have also known that Moses took that calf and burned it and ground it to powder and scattered it on the water, and then he made all the Israelites drink it. So at least the folks in Chapel Hill didn't do that. And it wasn't just Moses. It's not a one-time incident in Scripture. At God's command, Gideon tore down the Asherah poles and altars, again challenging the monuments that were erected to an unjust rule. And later in Israelite history, Josiah destroyed the physical embodiments of Baal, whose worship included the sacrifice of children. In fact, one consistent theme throughout the Old Testament is that the good kings of the Old Testament were willing to destroy physical manifestations of ideologies that were in conflict with God's desires for the world. And so you fast forward to today, and a simple historical fact is that Silent Sam was a monument erected to honor soldiers, particular soldiers, who fought to preserve a social order that denied the dignity and the worth of all of God's children. And I'm confident that many of these soldiers, some are the ancestors of you and me, and some are the ancestors of dear friends, I'm confident that these soldiers thought they were doing the right thing at the time. But this is precisely Paul's point to Timothy. The task of the Christian is to transcend the values of present culture, be they Greco-Roman culture or Southern culture, and to keep our enlisting officer in mind. And the simple truth is that as Christian people, our enlisting officer recognizes the equal value of all people. Now, sometimes when a minister says these kind of things, people think it's so much partisan politics and you know, take thinking one side or another. And, and if you're thinking that, let, let me invite you also to consider this. Every conservative Christian who takes the Bible literally and every liberal Christian who takes the Bible as good moral instruction and every elder in this church who has stood on these steps and said, yes, the Bible is God's word to me, anyone who reads the Bible as anything more than a historical curiosity also has to acknowledge that according to Judeo-Christian tradition, monuments to people and events and systems that violate human dignity are not of God. Now, you can argue all you want about who and what and where, but our job here as Christians is to transcend culture and time and take the view of the enlisting officer. And the view could not be more clear in Scripture. So let me close with this. There's a wonderful movie, many of you have seen it, called To Kill a Mockingbird, and in it, Atticus Finch is an attorney in a small southern town, and he understands the essential dignity of other human beings, and he's ostracized for it, and he's condemned for it, and for defending a man who's been wrongly accused of a terrible crime. And Atticus Finch tries to help his children, Scout and Jim, understand why he has to do what he's doing, why he has to defend this person who has been wrongly accused. And at one point he tells his daughter, Scout, you never really understand a person, Scout, until you consider things from his point of view. You have to climb inside that person's skin, and you have to walk around in it for a little while. I wonder if that would help us to think about climbing in another person's skin today and walk around in it for a little while and then see what we think about these issues. And then finally, one evening, Atticus Finch, after reading the paper, holds out his arms and he invites Scout to come sit in his lap and he comforts her because he knows and she knows that there is trouble ahead when people will sneer at her for the actions of her father. And he knows the community is going to judge him and he knows they're all going to have to pay 
and he tries to explain his actions. And he says, maybe when you and your brother are grown, maybe you'll look back on this with some compassion and see that I tried not to let you down, but this kind of issue goes to the essence of a person's conscience. I couldn't go to church and worship God if I didn't try to help that man. So here we are, August 26, 2018, Covenant Presbyterian Church of Charlotte, North Carolina, and ahead of us now, ahead of all of us, as a chance to practice our Christian faith, to put our Christian faith to work in a world that does not always hold its values. And for some of you, that may mean tearing down monuments. For others of you, it might be just tutoring a child who is affected by the influence of those monuments. Or it might be by joining in the Fall Habitat for Humanity Build, or singing in the choir, or serving at the night shelter, or visiting a lonely older adult, or joining our prayer team, or whatever way you find it, you're calling to offer help and healing in the name of Jesus Christ. And in the process, to transmit a faith to the next generation that affirms the two core values of Christian faith, the value of all God's children and a faith that is more than intellectual or devotional, but a faith that is behavioral, a faith that keeps in mind the values and perspectives and priorities of our enlisting officer. Let us pray together. Dear God, we are thankful for the privilege of living as your people in this world, and yet we also find it a tremendous challenge. So be with us and grant us strength, grant us courage for the living of these days. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen.